Hey folks, welcome to another Sunday School lesson. Today, coming from Bible Studies for Life. This is the lesson for July the 19th. And uh, it is kind of a standalone lesson stuck in the middle of two sections that you'll find in your Sunday School material. That section we just finished was entitled For Living with Hope was entitled... Um, that section we just finished was entitled Living with Hope in a Broken World. And next week we'll be entering into a session or a section that is entitled Why Do I Need the Church? And right in between there is this lesson entitled How Should I Respond to Politics? Coming out of Romans chapter 13. Well, if certainly there are a lot of politics happening right now because we're seeing elections that are going on and many that are upcoming uh, before we get to the end of the year we will have uh, elected hundreds of congress seats in washington uh, along with a bunch of senate seats of course the presidential election and then just a myriad of local elections from mayors to city councils to uh, state local government uh, just uh, the gamut of things out there and when you watch the news, uh, politics is all over it. Um, it. It's maybe hard to find a, a truly unbiased source of that news. We usually get it with one slant or another. Our country is divided along political lines on just about every issue that is out there. So it, it's hard to not be touched by politics in some way. And even if you don't enter into the dialogue about it and the debate about issues and things like that, because of the decisions that are made, the way that they eventually roll down to us, we are all affected by politics and the decisions of politicians. And that's nothing new. That's the way the world has worked uh, for a long, long time because God ordained the idea of government. And according to what we're going to read today, it is God who establishes that government and who uses it for his own means. Whether good politicians, bad politicians, God is still involved in the midst of them. And so as Christians, the way that we respond to politics and politicians and government and laws and rules and regulations uh, says a lot about our faith, says a lot about our understanding of God and his um, ideas for what he has set up in our governing structure. And it's, it, it goes a long way toward our witness. The way that we deal, the way that we talk, the way that we act and react in the avenue of politics has a lot to do with our witness of Christ. And so it's important for us to know what the word says about this. So let's look at that word because honestly what I say and what you say and what they think and what he thinks and she thinks and whichever side of the aisle they're on, that's really not the issue. The issue is what does God say about it? That's always the issue. So let's take a look at it. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard, which is going to be a, a word here and there different from what's in your in your Sunday school book if you're looking at that, but uh, a great translation of God's word. And I'm going to be reading Romans chapter 13, the verse 10 verses. All right, let's dig in. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, 
but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Father, I thank you for your word, and I pray your blessings on us as we look into it. Help us to see how to apply it into our lives in the area of politics in particular. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's walk through these scriptures. We, uh, we got to listen to the talking heads on TV talk about this politician says this and this one says that. The president did this. The president didn't do that. All the things that are out there that we are bombarded with all the time, we got to deal with that. And we've got to uh, engage with the folks at work and the people we run into in the store and our family members and all kinds of people on this idea. And the way that we present ourselves and our ideas about politics it's going to go a long way toward us being good witness or bad witness. So what does the Bible say? Starts off verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. All right. We're going to get to the reason for that in just a moment. But let's just camp there for a second. Every person. That means you. That means me. That means your uncle. It means your aunt. That means your brother, your sister, your parent, your co-worker, your teacher, your student, uh, your neighbor, everybody, everybody is to be in subjection. That means that we are to be um, obedient toward. That means that we are to be respectful to. That means that we are to follow along with. It means that we are to go in the direction that they are leading us. Now, let me stop right here. And because I always think about this, when I, every time I read this passage, I always, my mind always goes, what about the American Revolution? Were we being disobedient, our founding fathers, were they being disobedient to God when they rebelled against England and broke away and started a new country? Now the answer to that is no, I believe. Because what you find and you got to remember this as we think about being in subjection to governing authorities, okay? When governing authorities tell you that you have to do things that are opposed to God's authority, then they have crossed the line, and it is our duty to be disobedient to those governing authorities in order to be obedient to God, all right? And I think when I go back to the American Revolution and what I know of history, because of the things that were happening, it was time for America to say, no, we want to stand up here and be our own, be our own nation. Now, that's a whole history lesson that's really not for us to go into here. But it's the first thing that always pops into my mind about it. Example, in the book of Acts, I believe it's in chapter 5, when Peter and the boys had been talking about Jesus, and it was disturbing everyone, at least the religious powers that be. And they said, hey, you got to stop talking about Jesus. And they said, you know what? We can't do that because God has said we've got to talk about Jesus. So whether we're going to please you or please God, if that's the choice we have to make, we're going to please God. That, um, that aspect of obedience applies here, even though Paul is very emphatically saying in, in a very imperative matter that we are to be in subjection to the governing authorities. And he's going to give you a really good reason for that coming up real quick. Um, e even though we have that, we also have the qualification also in Scripture that when those governing authorities have told us to disobey God, we are to disobey those governing authorities. And 
having to always obey God first. So, that being said, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Why? Here's the reason. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. God created and ordained and orchestrated the, um, the framework, if you will, of government. The idea, the philosophy of putting people in charge of other people. That idea has been there for a long, long time. And it was God's idea. He set it up that way. And, and I believe that in every election, God's hand is there. Now, do we see sometimes that we think the wrong candidate got elected? Sure we do. But that doesn't negate the sovereignty of God, that there's a reason, and he is working in and through that. Um, we could go through some examples, but we don't have time to do that. But let's just say here is the basic premise. God ordained government, and he ordained it for us. For our good, mind you. And so we are to be respectful toward it. That might be a good way to sum up be in subjection to the governing authorities. Be respectful toward them. If we're going to be respectful toward them, then we're going to be obedient. And we're going to be supportive and prayerful. We'll talk about that a little more in, in a little while. Okay? Verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. All right, Paul here says that when we resist the authority that is set up, we're really resisting God. If we resist something that God has put in place, it's not so much that we're resisting that thing or that person or that group or organization. We are resisting God himself. Um, when... When, when uh, God spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden after they had sinned and taken from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God, good and evil, and God said, what happened here? Adam says, the woman that you gave me gave it to me. In other words, he wasn't blaming Eve, he was blaming God. And when we resist the authority that God has set up over us, then as long as they're not leading us away from God, then we are resisting God at the same time. Uh, and they who, this is the end of verse 2, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So you can expect there to be some pushback. Even if we don't do something that breaks the law and gets us in trouble, gets us arrested or gets a ticket, or whatever, there still are consequences that come. The idea of condemnation, that's an idea of guilt coming from God for doing what he has told us not to do. So even if we're not punished in physically in, in this life right now by government, there still is a mark against us from heaven itself. Verse 3, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you'll have praise for from the same. What a basic, simple idea that we don't have to fear government if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. If we're acting like we're supposed to act, if we're behaving the way that we should, if we're obeying the laws that are out there, if we're being good citizens, then we don't have to fear. If we don't resist, if we don't, um, if we don't act guilty, um, we don't have to fear. I see so many times in the news today um, that you know there's so much struggle out there with the whole Black Lives Matter thing and, and, and people against law enforcement and sometimes maybe law enforcement goes too far and, and sometimes they do. But by and large, the people who serve in law enforcement are doing a great job. 
and they are doing a much needed service. And a lot of times what you see is when they approach someone to question them or to say, hey, what's going on here? If that person is innocent and hasn't done anything, if they would just enter into a calm dialogue and respond to law enforcement and do the things that's requested of them, like, you know, put their hands up or, you know, don't resist, don't run, don't do all these things, then perhaps some of the things that happen that folks are in such arms about today wouldn't happen. Now, I don't know that that's the case, that every time things go out of hand that that's what's happened, but it looks like a lot of times it is. And so if I get stopped and uh, an officer asks me to step out of the vehicle, I'm not going to ask him why. I'm going to step out of the vehicle. And uh, if he, you know, asks me to keep my hands where he can see them, that's exactly what I'm going to do. They're not a rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. I don't want to have a fear of authority. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do what is good. It's just basic common sense right here. Um, verse 4, for it is a minister of God to you for good. You know what? We lose sight of this sometimes. We need to remember that government is set up for our good. It is set up to create laws that keep people safe, to create um, uh, an environment where there is opportunity for good things to happen. That's what government does. You know, government sees to it that uh, we have roads that work, that we have laws about what can happen with our drinking water and you know, all those sorts of things. And those are good things. And so we need to remember that, that it is there for good. Verse 4 continues, But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Just stating there that uh, God has given government the authority to enforce the rules that they put in place. And so we ought to know that when we oppose government, when, when it's telling us, hey, you need to do this good thing, and we say, no, we're not going to do that good thing, that there's a good possibility that there's going to be punishment that comes from our disobedient actions. Verse 5, therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So Paul lets his readers know right here that, we don't obey government just to stay out of trouble and avoid the punishment that comes, okay? That's the external reason for uh, about obeying government. There's also an internal reason, he says, for conscience sake, that we want to have a clear conscience before God that we have been obedient to his organization of government and in doing so have been obedient to him as well. And that makes our conscious is clear. Verse 6, for because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very, very thing. Um, the idea here is much like the children of Israel were instructed to give tithes and offerings to uh, fund, if you will, the Levites who served all the people. Uh, the idea here is that we pay taxes in order to pay for the services of the government that they have put together. Now, you can take this and go a lot of places in our world today of how, you know, maybe some government officials are overpaid and there's a lot of um, misappropriation of funds and that sort of thing. That's really another discussion for another time. The basic idea here is that it's the right thing to do for us to pay our taxes to support the government that God has ordained to be in place to make life better for all of us. And so it's not just paying taxes to be obedient but it's to, the, to the laws, but it's paying taxes to be obedient to God as well. Um, 
Verse 7, render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, another translation says tolls there, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So you got two um, very tangible things here, taxes and custom or tolls. In other words, the, the money, actual money that we are to pay, we are to do that. But then it also tacks on to it fear and honor which we can also wrap up in the word respect, to respect government. Every now and then, uh, I watch the 10 o'clock news. Not real often, because I probably watch the 6 o'clock news, and it's the same stuff. And You watch it about once a week. You kind of keep up with what's going on. But every now and then, I watch the 10 o'clock news, and then if I'm still sitting in front of the TV at 10.30, one of those late night talk shows come on, comes on, and I'll not mention names, but you know the ones I'm talking about. And pretty much every one of them opens, especially nowadays, with some kind of monologue that is extremely disrespectful to the president. And I can understand, everybody doesn't like our president, everybody's not a Republican, everybody's not on board with who he is and how he governs and his personality and all that, and I get that. But what bothers me is the lack of respect for the office of the president himself. And, and yeah, I think this verse is speaking to that, that we are to render to government tax and tolls, but also fear and honor or respect. We have lost our sense of respect for the offices of government in many cases in our society today. And I think that stems from, in large part, a loss of respect of God himself. We need to get that back. We need to have that. Verse 8, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Now he starts to encapsulate um, the one thing that kind of wraps this whole idea up of how should we respond to politics and how should we respond to politicians. We ought to encompass everything that we do in a spirit of love. Because when we talk about loving our neighbor, we recognize from other places in scripture that our neighbor can be very broad. And so a Christian in general ought to be marked by love their attitude, their um, outlook, the way that they respond to people should be marked by a sense of love, a spirit of putting others first, a spirit of self-sacrifice, uh, denying oneself, and taking up their cross daily. That we should have this idea of, hey, I, I want to see how, how can I express love toward you, toward your group, toward this situation. It's hard to do in many times, many cases, many places, but it's the right thing to do. And it was a little bit of example. Uh, Paul quotes from the Old Testament in verse 9 when he mentioned you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. He's just throwing out some examples right there. Certainly that's not an exhaustive list, and we know that because he said, and, and if there is any other commandment is summed up, by this saying, in other words, all the commandments that are given, as Jesus explained, can be summed up by, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, he did, Paul didn't go to the love God first. That really comes first, and then you're able to love your neighbor as yourself. It says, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So when we think about politics, maybe love's not the first thing that jumps into our mind. And yet, it should be the driving force behind our actions. Think about this. You love your country. I love my country. And so in doing that, I want to do things in my conversation, in my speech, in my voting, in my life, if I love my country, to help steer that country in the best possible way. And so, in doing that, 
We need to strive to have a sense of love for politicians. That, that just in our society today, that as it comes out of my mouth, it sounds so far away from where we are, because you see so much anger and bickering and hatred and and uh, division in our world. But I guess that's because in our world, most people aren't living their life based upon God's word. And sometimes that's the way it is in the church. So we need to be careful about that. We need to be loving. So let let me throw my two cents in here on how should we respond to politics, okay? First off, we ought to pray for politicians. We ought to pray for those who are in office. If you know them by name, pray for them by name. You see them in the news, you're watching it, be praying for them as you're watching the news. We should be prayerful. Secondly, we should be informed. We need to know what the issues are and, and, and what ramifications those issues have on life and who they affect. And we should be informed about politicians and where they stand on those issues. Don't make your decisions just based on somebody that you like or what your neighbor says or just what the news media says or the advertisements say. Dig into the records and see what do people stand for? What do they stand upon? And once you've done that, prayed, gotten informed about politicians and where they where they stand and what they believe, then vote. Go vote. Let your voice be heard. You may be one voice of millions, but you have a voice, and you need to let it be heard. And uh, if God leads you to run for an office, run for an office. We need Christians in offices. We need Christians in government. We need people who will stand up for God's values and God's word and God's law leading our country. So if he's leading you for that, go for it. Go get them. Um, You know, it's not a perfect system, but it's a system that we have, and it's a God-ordained system. And we have a duty as citizens of the country citizens of the kingdom to do our part to show love to demonstrate that love to be obedient until we can't be obedient to God at the same time and then we have a duty to be obedient to God Um, be prayerful be informed be a voter and make a difference I think that's how we should respond politics. Let's pray and ask God to really move through these elections that are coming up. Father, thank you for government. Thank you for putting it together to give some order and some structure into our lives. I thank you that we are not just a bunch of people who are running around without that order and structure. And I pray that as elections go forward this year, I pray that Christians would vote based upon your word and that people who follow you would go into office and help turn our country in your direction. Oh, that we would be one nation under God. Thank you, Father, for your word that guides us even in matters such as this. I pray your blessings on us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, thanks for listening today. And uh, if you have questions, I'd be glad to entertain them. Shoot me a text or an email, and I will see where that goes. If you want to receive my daily devotion, send me an email, and I'll put you on my list. I'd love to be able to speak into your life on a daily basis. I pray you have a great day. God blesses you. Blessings in our country, in our world, in Jesus' name.